Okay, so we're going to unravel one of the most famous and maybe one of the most misunderstood ideas in all of science. You've seen the equation a million times, E equals mc squared. But what it really means, well, that's a whole lot stranger and way more incredible than you've probably ever been told. And it all kicks off with this riddle right here. We know light has energy. I mean, you can feel the warmth from the sun, right? And Einstein's famous equation seems to say that energy and mass are two sides of the same coin. So how can photons, these little particles of light, have energy but zero mass? It just feels like it doesn't add up. And for years, the explanations were kind of unsatisfying. But the real answer means we have to completely reboot our understanding of what mass even is. So yeah, to solve this, we've got to go right back to square one. We have to challenge this super basic idea of what mass is. It's a word we use all the time, but what does it actually mean? We all learned this in school, right? Mass is just the amount of stuff something's made of. More stuff, more mass. It's simple, it feels right, and as it turns out, it's totally wrong. It's not just a little bit off, it's an idea we kind of need to just toss out. Okay, let's put this stuff idea to the test. Let's use ourselves as the experiment. You're made of fundamental particles, you know, quarks and electrons. So if your mass is just the sum of all that stuff, the numbers should add up perfectly, right? And this, this is where it gets absolutely wild. If you take every single fundamental particle in your body, every quark, every electron, and you add up their mass, you only get a tiny fraction of your total mass, we're talking like 1% to 5% maybe. So where's the other 95% of you? It's pure energy. It's the kinetic energy of quarks bouncing around like crazy, and it's the potential energy that's binding them all together. Most of your mass isn't stuff at all. It's energy. And that leads to this just mind-bending realization. E equals mc squared doesn't mean energy can be converted into mass. It means mass is a measurement of confined energy. They're the same thing, just in different units. There is no special substance called mass. So next time you step on a scale, you're not weighing how much stuff you're made of, you're weighing your locked up energy. So this is the crucial part we have to get right. It's all about the difference between the energy inside an object versus the energy of the object's motion through space. This distinction is everything. Think about it this way. If you squeeze a spring, you're packing potential energy inside of it. That spring genuinely becomes a tiny, tiny bit more massive. Or if you heat up your coffee, its molecules start buzzing around faster. You're adding energy to the system. And yep, its mass increases. But what about a tennis ball flying through the air? It's got kinetic energy, sure, but that's the energy of the whole thing moving. Nothing has changed inside the ball, so its mass stays exactly the same. And this idea has a name, a really important one rest energy. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's the energy something has when it's just sitting there at rest from your point of view. This internal confined energy. That's what E equals mc squared is really all about. That energy is mass. And now with this new tool, we can finally go back and solve that photon paradox. All right, back to our original question about the photon. Now that we're armed with this new definition of mass, the answer just clicks into place beautifully. Okay, just follow the logic here because it's so elegant. Step one, we now know that mass is rest energy. Step two, to measure rest energy, you have to be in the object's rest frame, basically flying alongside it so it looks still. But then you hit step three, the unbreakable rule of the universe. The speed of light is the same for everybody, which means you can never ever catch up to a photon and be at rest with it. So if an object has no rest frame, it can have no rest energy. And no rest energy means zero mass. Boom! Paradox solved. But you know how it is in science, right? You crack one huge mystery and another, even bigger one, is waiting right behind it. We've just explained why photons are massless. But why is their speed the absolute final can't break its speed limit for the entire universe? The answer to that question? Oh boy, this is where things get truly strange. It turns out that time itself isn't constant. It's flexible. And we can see why with a really cool little thought experiment. So imagine the simplest clock you can. It's just two mirrors facing each other with a single photon of light bouncing back and forth. Every time the photon hits a mirror, that's one tick. Tick, tuck. If you're right there with the clock, the photon just goes straight up, straight down. Looks perfectly normal. But now let's watch that same clock as it flies past us at, say, half the speed of light. From our point of view, the mirrors are moving forward. 
So for that little photon to get from the bottom mirror to the top one, it doesn't just go up, it has to travel along a longer diagonal path to catch up. And here, here's the punchline. We already established that the speed of light is the same for everyone. It never changes. So if our photon now has to travel a longer distance, but it can't go any faster, well then it simply must take more time to make the trip. From our perspective, we are literally watching the moving clock tick slower than our own. This isn't an illusion. Time itself is slowing down for that clock. That's time dilation. And look, this isn't just a fun idea. This is real. We've actually measured it. We've put super precise atomic clocks on jet planes, flown them around the world, and sure enough, they came back running just a few nanoseconds slower than the clocks on the ground. We see it with particles from space called muons. They should decay almost instantly, but because they're traveling near light speed, their internal clocks slow way down, and they actually survive long enough to reach Earth's surface. Moving things genuinely age slower. Okay, so moving things experience time more slowly. That's pretty bizarre. But how does that explain why there's a cosmic speed limit? Let's connect the dots. Well, as you get faster, this time dilation effect doesn't just add up, it goes crazy. It grows exponentially. At half the speed of light, time is only slowed by a little bit. But get up to 87% of light speed, and time for you is now passing at half the rate of everyone else. Get to 99.99%, and for every 22 seconds that pass for us, only one second ticks by for you. It's like you're hitting a wall. So imagine you're in a spaceship trying to accelerate. From our perspective, as you get closer and closer to the speed of light, your time slows to a crawl. And that means everything on your ship slows down. The clock, your thoughts, the chemical reactions in your engine, the very process that creates thrust and makes you go faster is from our point of view, grinding to a halt. So here's the bottom line. The faster you go, the harder it is to go faster because your own time is working against you. From our perspective, your ability to accelerate just keeps dropping off getting closer and closer to zero. To get that last little bit of speed and actually reach the speed of light would take you an infinite amount of your time or you'd need an infinite amount of energy. You're not just pushing against some physical barrier. You're fighting the fabric of space-time itself. And all of this leads to a new, much deeper way of looking at reality. This ultimate speed limit, it isn't really about light. It's the speed of something more fundamental. It's the speed of causality, the speed of cause and effect, which leaves us with two beautiful, simple rules that govern, well, everything. Rule number one, if something travels slower than the cosmic speed limit, you can be at rest with it. That means it must have rest energy and therefore it must have mass. That's you, me, this planet. Rule number two, if something travels at the cosmic speed limit, you can never be at rest with it, which means it has zero rest energy and it must be massless. That's the photon. It's not a choice. It's a fundamental consequence of how space-time is built. So what you should really take away from all this is that these bizarre reality-bending rules aren't just for physicists in a lab. They govern your body. They govern your phone. They govern the stars. This is the basic operating system of the universe. And it really makes you wonder, right, what other basic common sense ideas we have about our world are just as wrong just waiting for the next big insight to come along and rewrite everything we think we know.